Pavel, first of all, happy birthday. I'm very happy to, to participate in this event. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first time that I met you was in a, in a field arithmetic conference in Oberwolfach. Um, I think that when in Oberwolfach there is a traditional uh, hike, and at the end of the hike, you, you, you told me, and I think also Wolfgang was there, uh, you took me and Elad, we were both uh, young students, and you took us to sit with you in the cafe in, the, the cafe in uh, one of the villages there, and you told us that we need to, to eat uh, Schwarzwald Kuchen, right? And then we talked about mathematics. You, you told us some, uh, some open problems uh, in, go in profinite group theory about inver inverse limits of uh, finitely generated free profinite groups. And you told me that in order to appreciate this problem, I need to, to think about, uh, about it seriously. And indeed, I thought about it quite a lot for a certain time and couldn't solve this question. Uh, since then, I think we worked quite uh, quite a lot. We we met quite frequently every every uh, every I don't know a year or maybe less until uh, COVID, and then uh, somehow in COVID uh, all traveling was stopped. So I didn't see you since two thousand and nineteen. Um, and this conference is called the uh, Profinite Groups and Applications, and and. And this talk will be a bit a, a bit aside. It, it it relates to to profinite groups, maybe to the most interesting profinite group for number theorists, which is the absolute Galois group of Q. Uh, but it will be uh, quite aside. So so I prepared a talk which is more uh, introductory, and, and I will uh, not get into a lot of details. I know that this will disappoint you that it's not too technical, but. I hope you will survive it. So um, let, let's let's start with first. I will. What is Galois theory? So so we have this object that is called a polynomial, and uh, in Galois theory we take polynomial with uh, let's say integer coefficients, and we can also write it as a product of uh, x minus z i or z i are the roots and they are usually complex numbers. And we want to, to understand the arithmetic of the roots in terms of the coefficients. So the coefficients are given and the roots, there are some numbers in the complex numbers. And we want to understand what can we say about the arithmetics of them without actually find them. And this goes to Galois, of course, who wanted to, to check whether there is a, a root formula in terms of the coefficients. And his philosophy was that we need to look on the group of symmetries, which is the Galois group of, of the polynomial. Uh, and this Galois group is, uh, encodes the arithmetic information of the roots. Uh, and the point is, uh, uh, I wanted to give some examples. So we have a root if and only if the Galois group has a fixed point and uh, uh, the polynomial is irreducible if and only if the Galois group is transitive. And for this talk, I will focus on the last property that the Galois group is inside a n if and only if the discriminant is a non is a, a non-zero square. And and um, usually in application, what what I mean in application, we get a polynomial from our application. It can be from geometry or arithmetics or number theory. We get a polynomial. And in order to say something interesting, we need to compute the Galois group of this polynomial. So in application, we, uh, there are abundance of application and we, need, we are really interested in the direct Galois problem, namely given a polynomial uh, to compute its Galois group. Um, I like this quote of uh, Carl Sagan uh, that he says that there are naive question, tedious question, ill phrase question, question put after in educate self-criticism, but every question is a cry to understand the world. So, and there are no dumb questions. This is something that I really like in, in this quote. And, and in this talk, uh, uh, our naive question is, is a cry to understand the Galois theoretic world. This is the motivation for this question. And it says, it asks a very simple question. Given a finite group G, can we find a polynomial such that this is the Galois group? of, of uh, such a G is the Galois group of the, of the polynomial. 
So it's a very naive question. It doesn't have applications, but it's something that we, I think most people are really want to understand because it's so basic and so natural and so simple. And this is a famous question. It's called the inverse Galois problem, and it's widely open. And I think there are something like 100, 150 years of trying of tries to solve it, and it's still widely open. And it's a sync problem in the sense that a lot of interest in mathematics, it's simple and difficult, so it's, a, it's an attractive question, and a lot of interest in mathematics is developed to, to attack this problem. <laughs> and, um, and for example, in the studies to understand this inverse Galois problem, we develop tools that help us uh, to understand the direct Galois problem, which is very important in applications. And it's also a step in understanding the profinite group, which is the absolute Galois group of Q. As, as I said, this is a, a very central object in number theory, maybe the most important object in number theory, in, at least in some point of view. And I, I want to, to, to understand in this talk why this problem is so difficult, not how to solve it, because I don't know how to solve it, but I want to understand why I can't solve it and why other people cannot solve it. This is something that I want to understand, okay? Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask me uh, or to stop me, I mean, okay? So I, I'm going to, to take a, a probabilistic uh, a point of, of view of this problem to, that it's not important, it's not uh, important, but it, it helps us to, to look on it in a better way. Uh, it will give us more, it, it's very convenient to take a probabilistic point of view. And in a probabilistic point of view, I need a random polynomial. And there are, there are all kinds of ways to generate random polynomials. Maybe the, the way that we will discuss today is a, a more number theoretic point of view, which I call uh, the large box model. In, in, this, in this case, I take a polynomial there is a typo in the in the slide. I noticed it's i equals zero to n, not one to n. So there is a typo. Uh, so I take the polynomial such that the coefficients are uh, such that the degree is fixed, and the coefficients are uh, 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 are between minus h to h. So the coefficients are in in some box, and I let I fix the degree, the dimension of the box, and I let the the size of the box the grow to infinity. Okay, so this is a number theoretic point of view because it's actually counting polynomials because I choose them uniformly. A another way that we can choose that people uh, uh, generated random polynomials in the setting of Galois theory was a, a more group theoretic. So maybe people here know this type of results better. Uh, so you choose uh, some, some nice arithmetic group, for example, uh, SLNZ, which is finally generated. And then you take an element in this group in random. So in, in for example, one way that uh, people did it, like people like uh, Rivin, Kowalski, Zhuv, Zavine, and Lubotsky Rosenzweig was to, to take in uh, SLNZ is a finally generated group. So you choose a, a set of, of generators. Maybe you put some technical condition like it's symmetric or something like that. And then you do a random walk on, on the Cayley graph of the group. And then uh, after n steps, you get to some uh, random element, and then you take the characteristic polynomial. This is another source of random polynomials. Okay? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. A a another way that, uh, uh, that is very common in probability is to take polynomials such that the coefficients are sampled in some natural way. For example, you flip a coin for each coefficient, and you choose whether it's plus or minus one, and uh, and uh, and uh, and you let the degree go to infinity. Okay, so so this is in some sense perpendicular to the previous one because here I fix the the height, I fix the the size of the coefficients, but I let I let the degree go to infinity, so I choose more and more coefficients. Um, and, and in, in this model, it's very difficult even to show that the random polynomial is irreducible. And, and there was a, some progress by, by 
with some people uh, recently, but maybe I'll discuss it at the end if time permits. And, and another uh, way that people are uh, choosing random polynomial, which is in some sense perpendicular to the group theory uh, uh, setting, is now we choose a random matrix, but not uh, using the group theory, but we just take a random matrix with plus minus one coefficients. And then we let the dimension go to infinity. So Eberhard just took random matrices with plus minus uh, entries and uh, further Jen and uh, uh, Sain Sawani, they took symmetric matrices and, and they tried to understand the Galois theory of the, random, of the characteristic polynomial. So there are many models. I just uh, sample uh, some of them. Uh, and, and in this talk, I, I want to focus on the first model. And, and tell you what is known and what is not known and what, what challenges do we have, okay? So the large box model, this is the model that is the focus of this talk. So I remind you, I take the coefficient uh, independently and uniformly from uh, integer between minus and h and h, and then I, let, I want to understand what happens when h is going. Uh, since f is random, then gf is a random subgroup of Sn, of the symmetric group. And the big question is how gf distributes as a subgroup of Sn. And a first theorem that goes back to van der Waarden or maybe even to Hilbert is that uh, for most polynomial with probability going to one, the Galois group is, is the full symmetric group. This is a... a um, so, so most Galois groups are Sn in this setting, and and, and a, a question that I think already Van der Waarden asked is what is the next most probable group? Is it a transitive group or is it a non-transitive group, for example? So, uh, Van der Waarden conjecture that the next most probable group is is a. a, a is Sn minus one. So it's, it's the group with a, with a fixed point, which corresponds to polynomials with a root. So this was a conjecture he made in 1936. And, and just if you want to understand what is this probability, then the probability that the Galois group is Sn minus one, you can show that it's the same, it's asymptotically the same as the probability that F has a rational root. And this is also the same as the probability that F is reducible. And this is some explicit constant uh, depending on the degree times one over h. So it goes to zero because of the theorem of van der Waarden, but we know it, in what speed it goes to zero, one over h. And the question of uh, van der Waarden was, is there a group that appears with higher probability that there are more polynomials that uh, give you that group? Any conjecture that the answer is no. Uh, the problem is that it's, uh, how do you check it? I mean, okay, maybe you can prove it, but uh, how do you check it? So one way today, maybe not in 1936, is to run numerics. But the problem, let's say you take n equal uh, uh, 10, and I don't know, your favorite number that is uh, the number of uh, fingers. So, so it's for most people it's 10, and you want to, to run numerics on that. So, so the problem is that there are, way too many polynomials. So even numerics is very difficult to, to perform. And we want to understand what happens uh, in a set that has a, a asymptotic probability is zero. So, so when we run random uh, algorithms, we, we almost always get Sn. So it's, even numerics is very difficult to do here. But uh, so let's try to do numerics. Uh, and, and, and for this, it's very good if you have students especially good students. So, so this is uh, done with, the numerics is done with uh, two students, so Adav Neri and Noam Pirani. And we, we expected for probabilities to have, uh, so we took degree four because we didn't want uh, the, the probabilities to go to zero too fast. And we expect power law, so we plot uh, both axes in logarithmic scale. So, so a power law, so if the probability is h to some power, we will see a straight line. And then we, we, we try to, to compute all kinds of probability. So first, we compute the probability that the Galois group is, is S4. So what do we see? We, we took h, h is the size of the coefficients. So we took h 
uh, uh, bigger and bigger. So for example, here it's H equal 10 to the fifth, which is 10,000, I think, or 100,000, 100,000 probably. Ah, it's log on the, on the basis E, okay. So it's E to the five. And, and you see that the, uh, uh, the, the, the lower points are uh, what is expected by, by the theory, which is a theorem in this case, and the upper points is what we actually get. And we see that uh, at certain point, they, they really look very close to each other. Okay, and then we wanted to go beyond what is uh, what we know how to prove. So the second thing that we wanted is to see how, uh, what is the probability to be the dihedral group of, of degree four, so of order A. And here we, we also have a, a theorem by Cho and Dickman that give us up to a constant that it's, the probability goes like one over h squared times log h, h squared. So we plotted both of them and we got uh, up to a constant, which is multiplicative constant agreement. So again, this is a theorem, but we got an agreement quite fast. And then the next group that we wanted to check is the alternating group, A4. Here we don't know what should be the, the correct uh, asymptotics. And, and we plot it against the square root of, uh, uh, sorry, square root of H to the four. So uh, over one over H square. So we plotted uh, this. And I don't know if you think that this is agreement or not. It depends on how far you look on it. I mean, if they, if they are parallel, then it means that up to a multiplicative constant, they are the same. But I'm not sure that this is convincing to be parallel, but this is what we got. And the last one was a, a, a V4. This is a, a, the normal subgroup of order four inside S4. And here again, we have, a, we expect that it will be one over square root h less than d4, so, uh, so we plot it against that, and, and this is what we got. And this numeric took, took a lot of time and, and a lot of effort, and when we improved the algorithm so we can go a little bit higher, but, and this is in degree four, in degree five or six, it becomes much, much more difficult to, to even run numerics. Um, let me tell you what happened since uh, Van der Waarden uh, proved its theorem. So Van der Waarden proved uh, uh, the theorem that the Galois group is not SN goes to zero. And he conjectured what should be the outcome. This, this is the Van der Waarden conjecture that I mentioned before. And then there was a series of proofs trying to, to, to bridge the gap between uh, the Van der Waarden theorem and the Van der Waarden conjecture. So in 1956, uh, uh, Knobloch uh, proved uh, a power saving uh, bound, namely we, we want to get uh, that the probability that the Gal group is not as and we want to get that it's one over H. So we got that it's one over H to some power. This was the first result. And then uh, in 1973, the, the loud sieve started to be developed and Gallagher applied it to improve the, the bound from some power saving to a power saving a square root of H. So it proved the probability that the Gal group is not the same, is one over square root, is bounded by one over square root of H plus epsilon, which is some log uh, term. And this epsilon was removed by Zavine in uh, 2010 by the larger sieve. And, and in 2013, there was a, you see, it's a, a roughly 40 years after Gallagher, there was, there was the first improvement of the power saving since Gallagher. And this was done by Dietmann, who, who used a completely different method of, uh, used all kinds of uh, fancy results on uh, bounding on integral points on surfaces uh, to improve the, the, the bound instead of H to the minus half, we want to get to H to the minus one, right? This is the Gallagher conjecture, uh, the Van der Waarden conjecture, and he managed to improve from 0 0.5 to, uh, I think this is something like 
0 0.6, uh, how much is uh, uh, square, uh, 2 minus square root of 2? It's 0 0.6, something like this, right? I mean, square root of 2 is 1.4, so roughly. I mean. So this was a, a, a big breakthrough 40 years after Gallagher. And then uh, something very weird happened, but I guess it's something common in mathematics, that in one year there were uh, three big papers improving on this. And this was in 2021. So first there was a, a, theorem, a, a paper by Dittman and Cho, and then by Gaffney, Lemke, Oliver, uh, Lowry, Duda, Shaken, and Zhang, and, and lastly by Bargeva, which really did a, a tremendous improvement. So each one of these results improved on the, on the, on the result from 2013, but Bargava made a huge gap. And all of these were uh, subsec subsec subsequently, one after the other in, the, in 2021. So instead of saying exactly what each one did, I, I will, because now all of them are uh, suppressed by Bargava, I will mention uh, what Bhargava did. He, he made a big breakthrough and he, he, he managed to go all the way to H minus one. So, so just if you don't remember, this is the Van der Waarden conjecture. The Van der Waarden conjecture is that the Galois group, the probability that the Galois group is not SN is the same as the probability that the Galois group is SN minus one, which, in, which is an explicit constant that I don't want to write times H minus one. Okay, and some people call it the Van der Waarden conjecture also, uh, but, but it's, it's a slightly, slightly weaker uh, version where you just prove that the Galois group has the same order of magnitude, that the probability that the Galois group is not SN is O of H minus one. I mean, without catching the actual constant, okay? And what Bhargava managed to prove very recently is this uh, weak Van der Waarden conjecture. More precisely, he proved two results that together give the, the weak conjecture. The first result, which is, is that the Galo group, the probability that the Galo group is not SN is captured either in what we expect, the probability that the Galo group is SN minus one, or by the probability that the Galo group is AN, and if you take this uh, asymptotic, the error term is much, much smaller than what we want. So, so we showed that the second most probable group is either SN minus one or AN. And the second thing that he did, which was the, the really, really break, the really, really big break, breakthrough was to prove that the probability that the, to bound the probability that the Galois group is AN by O of H minus one. And this was a, a major breakthrough and uh, this part, and, and he really he had to, to insert, a, 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 not only he had a, a lot of very strong and technical uh, uh, tools, he also had a, some, some very smart new ideas. So, so it's a combination of really ingenious argument plus a lot of uh, proficiency in, uh, in uh, analytic number theory. So, so Bhargava, after essentially 100 years, proved that the probability for AN is bounded by one over H. So, so if we take H, yeah. But, but is it really the case? Uh, so I want to understand how small is, is uh, the probability that the Galo group is AN. Is it what Bhargava proved? Is it close to the reality or is it far from the reality? And I thought I will give you some conjecture. So this is a reminder of what Bhargava did. Um, and a difficult conjecture that, that is going beyond, beyond a little bit beyond what Bhargava did is to prove that the Galois group, that the probability that the Galois group is AN is small O of H to the minus one. And this will imply the full Van der Waarden conjecture. So this is very, very difficult because it's very, difficult to go after what, I mean, the paper of Valgava exploits this approach uh, completely. So, so you need a new idea, completely new idea to get to this. A more difficult conjecture is to prove that the Galois group is actually small O of H minus two. And an even more difficult conjecture is to prove that the Galois group is H to the 
it, it goes, the exponent is, is, sub, is, is linear in n. So here all the exponents are constant, but maybe the exponent is linear in n. And what at least I believe that uh, uh, the correct order of magnitude should be is that the Galois group is h to the minus n over two plus epsilon. And if you think about it, I mean, if h is, for example, uh, 10, then one over h is one tenth, but uh, one over h to the minus n over two is a, is an extremely small number. So this is something that you cannot catch in a computer. I mean, it's very difficult to catch in a computer. One n is once n is is difficult. So this is something that you cannot go in the street, and even if you have a one, if you even if you go in China where there are one billion uh, residents, you still will not be able to find the the the, the guy that uh, has Galois group a n. So. so. I'm not sure if it's yeah, the correct analog, but um, but before I will explain this conjecture, let me give you naive heuristics. Why, why the naive heuristic is, by the way, okay. So um, what is the naive heuristic? We want to understand why, why the uh, the probability that the Galois group is a n. Now the first naive. Uh, the first uh, assumption, which is a heuristic assumption, I don't know how to prove it, is that the probability that the Galois group will be a n is roughly the same as the probability that the discriminant of the polynomial will be a square, a non-zero square. Because we already, I already mentioned it, that the Galois group is inside a n if and only if the discriminant is a non-zero square, and Galois groups tend, tend uh, to be as large as possible. So this is, I think, a reasonable, uh, heuristic assumption, although I have no clue how to prove something like this. Uh, uh, the second thing, which is, uh, which is something that I, I even know how to prove, is that the discriminant of f is a polynomial in the coefficients of degree 2n minus 2. So when I plug in numbers, when the coefficients are of size uh, roughly h, then the discriminant will be roughly of size h to the 2n minus 2. Now, the third heuristic assumption is the worst, because this I'm not even sure that it's correct. In fact, I know that it's incorrect. But, but just this is why it's naive heuristic. Naively, if we have a number of size h to the 2n minus 2, then we expect that it will be a square with probability 1 over the square root of the number, right? If we have a random number, the probability that it's a, it's a square is 1 over the square root of this number. So, so the probability that the discriminant will be a square, we, we expect that it will be one over h to the minus n minus one. So it says that, uh, for example, from uh, in a box of size h, we will have roughly uh, out of h to the n polynomial, we will have we will roughly have h polynomial with square discriminant. Uh, this naive heuristic is false because of the third uh, step. Uh, the point is that the discriminant is, uh, doesn't behave like a random number. It's, it has a lot of symmetries. And this is the, um, I mean, I saw this naive heuristic in, a, I don't remember, in a paper or in a talk, and, and, uh, and I did it myself also. And, and it seems very weird that there are so many, so little, if, if I believe this heuristic, so little uh, 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 polynomials with Galois group AN. So, so, uh, together with uh, with, two, with a student and a postdoc, with Orben Porat and Vlad Matai, we looked for for non-trivial symmetries, and uh, and then we got the following uh, thing: we got that the probability that the Galois group is a n is at least h to the minus three over four n. So so it cannot be minus n as as the naive heuristic says, and this is due. Uh, to non-trivial symmetries, let me tell you one of the symmetries. I mean, so so I, I give you the easiest uh, to state uh, symmetry. So I assume that n is divisible by four, just because uh, it makes the symmetry slightly easier to write. And I let I look on polynomials that have this special form f plus f prime equal g squared. So it's a polynomial that if I add the derivative to itself, I get a square. So 
What's the point that the discriminant of f, I'm using a formula for discriminant. Discriminant is the resultant of f and f prime. And resultant is, a, if you think about one of the formulas for resultant as a product over the zeros of f, when I evaluate f prime at the zeros of f, then it's clear that I can replace f prime by f plus f prime. So it's, it's the same value. And then because of my assumption that the uh, f plus f prime is g square, I get that it's the resultant of f g square. And again, by taking the formula in terms of the zeros uh, of g, each zero of g square comes with double uh, multiplicity. So it's the same as the resultant of f g square. So I see that in this family, the discriminant is always a square. And how many polynomials like this I have? Uh, so, so the Galois group is, uh, is, is inside IN, and I can prove that in this case, almost surely the Galois group is, is really IN. And how many polynomials like this I have? Okay, G I can choose freely, but I need that the, the size of the coefficient will be smaller, of, smaller than H. So if I take the, the size of G is of degree N over two, and if I take the, the coefficient of g smaller than square root of h, then the coefficient of g square will be roughly square root, uh, smaller than h. So I have n over two coefficients. I have each one of them can be a number between minus square root of h and square root of h up to some constant that I ignore. Then, at, uh, then I have um, at least uh, h to the n over four such polynomial. And therefore I get h so, so if I normalize, I get uh, what I stated at the beginning. And this is very similar to something that uh, Lanzmann, Lenke, Oliver, and Tom did, uh, uh, but they counted number fields with uh, square, uh, with a, a n number fields, and they counted by discriminant. And counting by discriminant is slightly different. And you know, when you do something like this, I mean, the symmetry is so simple, f plus f prime equal g square. So the, the, once you find such a simple uh, uh, symmetry, you, you try to, to, to look back in the literature and, and, and see who did it before, because it's, it's impossible that, you know, the, the, all the society, the, all the community of Galois theory missed this symmetry. And indeed, we found very similar in this work of uh, Lanzmann, uh, Lemke, Oliver, and Tom, this uh, very similar uh, uh, symmetry. And essentially, if you go back in the literature, you can find that uh, this symmetry appeared in a paper by some guy called Hilbert. Hilbert did it before uh, 19,000. And even Hilbert uh, thought about this philo philosophy, and Hilbert said, that he saw it in a paper of Hurwitz. I didn't go back to the paper of Hurwitz, uh, but uh, <laughs> so, so this symmetry was uh, going back quite a lot, not exactly this one, but very similar one. Uh, but still in uh, what we did, we put it in this scheme of uh, uh, probabilistic value theory. Um, so it goes back to Hilbert and maybe even to Hurwitz, uh, but still it gave us uh, uh, this lower bound and the second thing we, we did was to try to, and, and see, can we get better lower bound if we don't really care about the Galois group? And then we found different symmetries. I mean, we have this conjecture that most probably the Galois group is a n if the, given that, uh, uh, given that uh, the discriminant is a square. So we said, okay, let's focus on the right hand term without caring about the connection. Although we, we don't know how to prove this conjecture, we don't even have a clue. It's a very, very interesting uh, uh, open problem, but very difficult. Um, sorry. And, and we, we showed that for the right hand event, I mean, we find a large family of polynomials F with a square discriminant. So here we get H to the minus N over two minus half which is very, very close to what at least I believe is the correct answer, but it's a naive uh, belief that it's, it should be h to the minus n over two. And how did we found this? Uh, yeah, so this is better than uh, what I mentioned before, because here it's three over four and here it's a half. And this is a lower bound. 
So, so this is again, it's a very simple argument. We take a, a polynomial which only have even all the odd coefficients are zero. Okay, so this only works for a even degree. I forgot to write it in the theorem. This is only for even degree. So I take a polynomial such that all the odd coefficients are zero. So it's a composite with x squared. And then I, I will not give you the details. Then you can show that it is, in this case, the discriminant is a square if and only if the free coefficient is a square. So I can choose all the coefficients as I like, and only the last coefficient should be a square. So the probability that the discriminant is a square is at least the probability that the free coefficient is a square. So it's h to the minus n plus one over two. This is the number of coefficients. Okay. And the drawback is that in this family, the Galois group is never a n. <laughs> it's always a, 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 a coxtator group of type d n over two. I wonder, I guess that in this talk, everyone know what it is, right? I'm trying to see, Pavel, are you nodding? Do you know what is coxeter group of type d n over two? Yes, yes, you, we can assume that. Yeah, but but even I can assume it. But even if I don't assume it, it's a very simple group. It's just uh, uh, all the even uh, automorphism. So you take it, the automorphism of the graph, right? The of this graph, and you take all even uh, uh, elements in this. So it's a very simple group. I mean, it's a subgroup of the Rick model. I mean, not simple. Uh, not simple in the group directed sense, simple in the human directed sense. Um, so, so we got a, a very good, in my eyes, lower bound, but but none of these polynomials is is as Galois group A M. So, so this is what we know how to say. Let me talk a little bit uh, just to, to let you know about what happens in other models. So let's talk uh, about the restricted coefficient model. For example, you, you, we take the, I said before, take the coefficient plus minus one or, or we take the coefficient to be zero one. It can be with a uniform, uh, I mean, zero one with probability half or any other distribution that you, you want. So let, let's just take zero one for, for, for just for, for the fun of it. So in this case, this is very recent. Under GRH in number theory, this is very known what is GRH. It's, uh, it's, it's called the generalized, generalized Riemann hypothesis. It's the, so under the generalized Riemann hypothesis, which is, okay. Um, so under the Riemann hypothesis, we know that uh, this is just whether the polynomial is irreducible or not. Uh, we know that the polynomial is irreducible with probability one, but we need a generalized Riemann hypothesis for this. And this is a recent result by Brouillard and Vario. Um, unconditional result, uh, the best unconditional result is that the probability is, uh, this is a number theoretical uh, notation. The probability is bigger than a constant that doesn't go to zero. This is my result together with uh, two co-authors, Kukulopoulos and Cosma. So the probability doesn't go to zero. It's bigger than some, some, some number. I think probably 0 0.1 is okay. I mean, it's explicit number. I forgot to compute it before this talk. Okay. Um, um, in these two cases, you can prove that the Galois group is AN or SN. With, with the same probability, but in these two cases, we cannot distinguish between A and O S. And so, so in this setting, even under the general Riemann hypothesis, we don't know to show that A and appears with probability zero. So this is the same uh, philosophy that if you want to understand how the Galois group distribute, so uh, after S N, the most difficult group to, I mean, Usually you can say something about SN, but it's very difficult to, to bound the probability for AN, although you know that it's, it's small. So this is open even under GRH uh, today. 
And very recently, uh, Hawk, David Hawken uh, uh, considered a slightly simpler case, which resembled the lower bound that we that I discussed before that I did with Oben Porat and Vlad Matai. He took reciprocal polynomials with plus minus one coefficients, and he showed that in this case, the probability to be a square is, is, is going to zero. It doesn't matter, he computed how fast, but it's important that it goes to zero. But this is for reciprocal, reciprocal polynomials. So as in the previous case, reciprocal polynomials never have Galois group AN. It's always a imprimitive group. Another model that I mentioned is random matrices. So if you take the matrices with zero one entries, Heberard using the tools of Briard Varyu and, uh, uh, and using the tools developed for the restricted coefficient model managed to, to show that under GRH, the characteristic polynomial is irreducible. And uh, Ferber, James, Sa, and Sawani did the same for symmetric matrices, again, under GRH. And, and lastly, I want to, to say why it's so difficult. Uh, I hope that it's okay, Pavel, this picture. I thought that you will take it uh, in a funny mood. So, so I want to say why it's so difficult. The inverse Galois problem, there is this joke about the guy that lost his, his key and he's looking under the lamp, although he didn't lose it under the lamp. So, so, uh, uh, so it's so difficult to, 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 to the inverse Galois problem is so difficult because we only have the light on SN or maybe on some special uh, families of polynomials. So we just don't know how to look on other groups. And, and, and Pavel, this picture is from the last time that you were in Tel Aviv. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so I think I will finish here. Th thank you very much. And thank you, Pavel, for being such a great uh, colleague all these years since I started uh, my, my, my research. Thank you very much and happy birthday. Thank you, Leo, for this very nice talk and a successful talk. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Well, first, uh, I have to thank you for being my collaborator because it was very, uh, always a pleasure to work with you. But I have a very naive question. You were always talking about uh, finite uh, Galois groups, but can you do probabilistic methods just for, with infinite Galois groups? Uh, that, uh, it's closer to my field. Uh, yeah, yes, I agree. Um, so it depends. Sometimes you can reduce infinite groups to finite groups, like using Frattini argument or something like this. But this maybe will not be interesting because it, it's just reducing to finite groups. But uh, in general, there are interesting questions about infinite groups in the setting of Galois representations and uh, especially arboreal representations where, where you get, given a polynomial, you get a, an action on an infinite tree with, let's say, with the, with a, I mean, it's very similar to the talk we had on, on yesterday in the morning. So you, you if you take, let's say, a polynomial of degree two, you look on three images of three images of three images, and you get an, a, a tree of degree, I mean, the, the, the number of, uh, how do you say, of, the descendants is, is the degree of the polynomial. So you get an action on a regular tree and, and the, the image is very interesting and add, has a lot of applications in, in dynamic and stuff. And there maybe for finite group theory can be handy, but, uh, but um, the, and, and I don't think you can really reduce it to finite groups. So you, you really need to use some kind of combination of group theory and, and arithmetic in them non-trivial way, but, but uh, this is something that I, I'm not aware of uh, very, I mean, the analog in Galois representation is the works of people like uh, Jean-Pierre Serre and others about large images of Galois representations that use a lot uh, uh, profound group theory, especially uh, theodic analytic groups. So maybe one can develop a, a theory of a, the, the, the relevant theory for the, I mean, the combination between the arithmetic and the theory of uh, profinite groups acting on trees, 
automorphism groups of trees to get some, some meaningful and important uh, arithmetic information on compositions of, of polynomials. This would be, I mean, really, really amazing results, but maybe, but the theory is not developed enough. Okay. This is one direction that, that might interest you. Thank you. So, so you should come to Tel Aviv again and we can discuss it in more detail. Well, uh, when I'm uh, coming in that direction, I will inform you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You're always welcome. Okay, I see no uh, raised hands. So please join us in thanking Yor again, please. Thank you very much.